This is Orbiting Jupiter by Gary Schmidt. In chapter four, we learned a lot of information about Joseph's past. He was able to feel safe enough and comfortable and cared for enough by Jack and his parents that Joseph shared uh, all of the events in his life that have helped shape the person that he is now. Um, we could go back through and trace all of those conflicts about how one um, confrontation or one bad event led to maybe some not great choices that just continued the conflict. Um, all of this is having major consequences, obviously, in Joseph's life. Um, luckily, he is now in a safe place, and um, I'm hopeful as a reader that things are going to start to work out for him and that he is going to be able to find some happiness. I'm wondering also as a reader whether or not Jack's parents are going to uh, be able to follow through and help Joseph reconnect with his daughter, Jupiter. I'm wondering if that would be the best thing for Joseph. I'm wondering if that is uh, going to be a good thing for Jupiter, too, for his young daughter. Um, we're going to continue reading in Chapter 5 and see if uh, any of that has resolution, but we're also going to come into even more conflict because we're, remember, only about halfway through the book. Um, so there's definitely going to be more drama coming up ahead. Um, so we'll pay attention to what types of conflicts we're noticing and what the impacts are of those consequences. Now, not just on Joseph, but also on Jack and his parents. And then potentially, if in the book we ever meet Jupiter, um, maybe what the consequences are um, for her. So, chapter five. I figured out what Ernie meant a couple of days later in gym class, a Friday when Coach Switek was gone to some stupid PE conference and we had a substitute who knew as much about running a gym class as a gerbil would. I knew when Ernie told me we had to roll up the mats at the end of class and I went to do it with him and Coach Substitute hollered, hey, thanks for doing that without my asking. And I looked at Ernie and then I looked around the gym and some of the other eighth graders were still shooting baskets, but Joseph had already gone into the locker room. Nick Porter and Brian Boss and Jay Perkins were gone too. Ernie said, Jack, I dropped my side of the mat. Ernie said, don't, but I did. The way into the eighth grade side of the locker room was blocked by stupid eighth graders standing like cows at a gate they can't get through. I ran down the center aisle to the en other end of the locker room. Someone was slamming against the lockers and slamming again, and I heard Joseph yell something and someone else yell something, and then I got to the end of the aisle and turned into the eighth grade side. Jay Perkins was on the floor, bent over and holding his nose because of all the blood coming out of it. He was hollering, but the words were sort of snotty and hard to make out. Past him, Brian Boss and Nick Porter were both holding Joseph and slamming him again and again against the lockers. I figured they'd worn their cups. Beyond them, the stupid, stupid, stupid eighth graders stood watching, watching as Joseph got slammed again and again. Joseph didn't have much of his shirt left on him, and you could imagine the welts the lockers were leaving on his back. Some blood, too, but that might have been from Jay Perkins. The look on his face? What do you think? Until he saw me. He couldn't say anything because Nick Porter suddenly had his hand across Joseph's jaw, and he was strangling him and shoving him back into the lockers. But even so, when Joseph saw me, he shook his head. He wanted me out of there. Then Jay Perkins stood up. Someone called out, Jay, enough but I don't think Jay Perkins even heard him. And if he did, he wasn't thinking it was enough. He stood in front of Joseph. He was still hollering, but he was snarling too. He pulled his arm back and Nick Porter took his hand away from Joseph's face and Joseph closed his eyes. Everything stopped. The stupid herd of eighth graders, Nick Porter and Brian Boss, Joseph, Jay Perkins with blood on his fist, everything stopped. And I thought I heard some of the words Joseph cried in his dreams, the words I didn't even know, I think they were coming from me. I pushed off from the lockers, took three quick steps, and slammed into Jake Perkins' back. His face plowed into the wire mesh of the lockers, and he fell to his knees again. Then the words were coming out of Jay Perkins, and he didn't just say them. He screeched them loud enough to be heard in a whole different wings of Easton Middle, High, Middle School. And while he said what he was saying, Brian Boss turned to look at me, and Joseph brought his right knee up as hard as he could. It turned out Brian Boss wasn't wearing a cup after all. He threw up all over Jay Perkins. Then he screeched too. And his right arm now free, Joseph smashed his own fist into Nick Porter's face. 
again and again and again. He was crying, like at night. He stopped only when the stupid herd of eighth graders scattered and coach substitute ran in to find out what all the screeching was about. It would have to be Mr. Canton. I sat in his office, still in gym stuff, with some blood on me, not mine. Two offices down, Joseph and Brian Boss and Nick Porter and Jay Perkins were in Principal Tuckman's office. You could tell that Jay Perkins was there by the smell since he had Brian Boss's throw up all over him. But I was in Mr. Canton's office and Mr. Canton was standing behind his desk, probably so he wouldn't scuff up his shoes. His arms were crossed. So you wanna tell me what a sixth grader was doing in the eighth grade side of the locker room in an eighth grade fight, he said. Winning, I said. Don't be smart, Jackson. We've talked before about what happens when you're around Joseph Brook. It was three guys on one, three against one. What was I supposed to do? For starters, go get a teacher. I looked at him. Would you have left a guy being beat up to go find a teacher? Mr. Canton looked at me and then sat down. This is what I meant, Jackson. Jack, Mr. Canton nodded. This wasn't your fight. This wasn't about you. But look, what happened? You might get suspended for fighting, all because you were hanging around Joseph Brook. I'm telling you, I know his type. Trouble follows him like a yellow dog. I've seen what happens to yellow dogs, I said. It was three against one. Mr. Canton sighed. Yes, it was. I'm not saying you didn't think it was the right thing to do. And I'm not saying it was, and I'm not saying it wasn't. The point is, you're a different kid around Joseph Brook, and not a better kid. You need to be careful around him. Maybe put some distance between you two. I did think it was the right thing, I said, and you still didn't answer my question. Would you have left a guy being beat up to go find a teacher? Mr. Canton sighed again. Go get clean, he said. Bell rings in 10 minutes. I did. Meanwhile, Mr. Canton called my parents. The talk I had with Mr. Canton was pretty much the talk I had with my mother and father. I needed to not get pulled into the trouble that followed Joseph, they said. I needed to remember I was in sixth grade and not in eighth grade. And I was not the hero who was supposed to be going to the rescue all the time. I needed to remember that. Would you have left a guy being beat up to go find a teacher? I asked. My father, he wiped his hand across his face and what was left behind was a smile. Really, a smile. Not in a million years, he said. John, said my mother. Well, he asked, said my father. Just be careful, Jack, be careful. My mother took my hands. Jack, she said, you do understand that Joseph is not your, I know, I said. My mother stood and held me. Then my father sent me out to start the milking. They talked with Joseph next. That night, before he turned the light out, Joseph sat on the desk. He had a few bruises darkening both, si both his sides and some cuts on his back from the wire lockers. And his left cheek was a kind of zombie blue. Jackie, he said. Jack. Yeah. Listen, you should have stayed out of it. Maybe, I said. You should have. He jumped off the desk and turned the light out. Against the starlight coming in the window, I saw him turn to watch for Jupiter. But you know what? He said. What? No one's ever had my back before, except Maddie. Thanks. I got up and stood next to him in the dark. He pointed to Jupiter, lit up, brighter than anything else in the sky. The air was so cold, it was chiming like a struck tuning fork. I was shivering and my feet were freezing, but I guess I was about as happy as I'd ever been. Joseph and Brian Boss and Nick Porter and Jay Perkins all got four days of suspension for fighting, the last four days before Christmas vacation. The letter Mr. Tuckman sent said they should, would be expelled if there were further incidents and they would have to make up all their missed work once they got back in, to school in January, including the PE periods, except Joseph didn't have to wait until January to make up all his classes. When I got home the first Monday of Joseph's suspension, Mr. Dalney and Mrs. Holloway were just getting out of a car. You know how strange it is to see teachers at your house? You instantly feel like you must have done something you'd rather not have your parents hear about. But they weren't there for me. They were there for Joseph. So Mrs. Holloway graded papers while Mr. Dalney went over some proofs with Joseph and assigned his homework. And when he was done, Mr. Dalney graded papers while Mrs. Holloway went over 
poetic scansion, which no one really cares about. And she made me identify stressed and unstressed syllables and name their rhythms with Joseph, even though I was going to have to do it again in class the next day. But she said it would be good preparation. So I should stop fussing, sit down and get busy. And when she was done and they were getting ready to leave, she left Joseph a bunch of homework for the next day too. Coach Switek was pulling up in his van. Joseph and I went out and he said, show me your barn. And we went into the big barn and he said, this'll do, go get the weights in the back of the van. And he threw Joseph the keys. So we brought the weights into the big barn, four trips. And Joseph said, isn't it going to be cold out here? And coach Switek said, it's a tough world kiddo. And that was that. PE for Joseph was lifting weights in the barn for an hour. And me too, since, since coach Switek said it wouldn't hurt. They came all four days of Joseph's suspension all four days, so he wouldn't have to make up those classes in January. At the beginning of Christmas vacation, we saw Brian Boss and Nick Porter and Jay Perkins at the Easton Library. Not that they were in the library, but we were, since Joseph needed the second volume of Octavian Nothing. It had snowed pretty hard and the streets were white with packed snow. When we came out, they were driving by, Jay Perkins on a snowmobile with a face that looked like it had been smacked up against a locker, which it had, and Brian Boss behind Nick Porter on his snowmobile. They drove by slowly, watching. Joseph handed me the second volume of Octavian Nothing, and he stood with his hands at his sides, watching back. On the way home, they passed us again on the road. You're dead, kid, Jay Perkins hollered from his snowmobile. Joseph handed me the second volume of Octavian Nothing again, and he watched. we watched them until they turned out of sight. Then he looked at me. Don't let them get behind you, ever. He said, I won't, I said, and then he took the book back. It was the last time we went outside for a few days, except when we went out to the small barn for Quintus Sertorius and the big barn to milk and to lift weights, wearing just about everything warm that we owned, including the long underwear. The weather turned even colder, the kind of cold that froze the inside of your nose as soon as you stepped out of the house and the sound of your foot on the snow was a crunch, and you half closed your eyes against the freezing, and you held your coat tight against you. Still, there's something about coming into a barn full of warm cows, their sweet breath, the scent of the dry hay, and the sounds of their shuffling and snuffling. With the lanterns hissing, it all glows. And like I said, leaning against a warm cow during milking is fine. The cows were always glad to see us, maybe because they had nothing else to do, closed up in the barn for the winter. Dahlia would look around and sometimes she would wink, really. And Rosie, now Rosie mooed, whenever she heard Joseph coming into the barn, she waved her rump in delight. When he milked, she thought she was ju giving just for him. And when he milked, Joseph talked about Madeline. And when we lifted weights, Joseph talked about Madeline. And when we carried bales of hay to Quintus Sertorius, Joseph talked about Madeline. At supper, he talked about Madeline. At night, in the dark before sleep, he talked about Madeline how the first time he danced with Madeline was during a snowstorm. He knew he was going to have to walk seven miles home and the snow was already darkening in the afternoon, but it was warm inside and he was warm inside and they touched hands and Madeline laughed and she began to hum how they'd held each other and danced to Madeline's humming. And she had her eyes closed, but Joseph watched her. He didn't want to close his eyes. He didn't ever want to close his eyes. He didn't want to miss a second. How one wintry day they dueled with long icicles that had dripped down from the roof and how she hit his icicle again and again and clipped it down to a little nub and how she stabbed him in the chest with her icicle and he fell down like he was dead and suddenly she got all scared and yelled at him to get up don't do that get up and he did how madeline liked to watch movies eating popcorn with cinnamon but never butter how madeline liked to read poetry and how he pretended that he did too but she really knew he really didn't and madeline how Madeline wanted to go to MIT someday and become an engineer and travel to places that needed her, where she would dig deep wells so that no one would ever have to go without fresh water again. How Madeline loved going barefoot. How Madeline's teddy bear was named Bunny Bo for no reason. How they could be quiet with each other. How holding her hand warmed everything in him. How he sometimes still felt for her hand. I guess that night at the pond, while my father and mother and I got colder and colder listening to Joseph, I guess that night unfroze him. On Christmas Eve morning, after milking, my father and Joseph and I took a couple of bow saws and an axe, just in case, and headed up into the hills to find a tree. 
not too far since we had to drag it back. My father and I usually argued back and forth about which one to take, but we didn't this year. For Joseph, this was the first Christmas tree he'd ever had. And when he looked at one and touched its branches and smiled, number five, sort of, it didn't seem right to argue. It was a sweet fur that cut easily and Joseph and I each took a side and we carried it back home and put it up in the front room. Like every year, the smell of it meant Christmas. My mother had brought the boxes of ornaments down from the attic and we waited while my father fussed the lights on and then we opened the boxes. Every ornament a story, the old ones from when my mother was a kid, the handmade ones from my first grade and second grade and third grade, the red glass bulbs my father bought my mother one Christmas, the 12 golden angels, including this year's new one, one for every year of my life, the glass bluebird with spread wings, the carolers with knitted mufflers, the silver trumpet, the cockeyed teddy bear with his red and white scarf, the tiny sled packed with tinier toys. When we were almost finished, my mother went out into the kitchen and brought back a small box. This one's for you, she said to Joseph, for your first Christmas with us. And she handed him the box, another golden angel. Joseph took it out of the tissue paper. He hung it on the tree and pushed it a little with his finger. It turned and glittered with the lights. Jupiter would love this, he said. We milked a little early on Christmas Eve afternoon since Christmas Eve at night and Easter in the morning are the two times my mother is going to have us at first at new first congregational, even if the gates of hell stand against us, she said. That meant we ate early and scrubbed long, Joseph too. Afterwards, she inspected us, especially the zombie blue patch on Joseph's left cheek. And while she inspected, she asked Joseph if he'd ever been to a congregational church service before. And he said he hadn't ever been to any church service before, congregational or not. My mother looked at him. Never once, she said. He shook his head. Didn't your mother? And immediately she knew she'd gone too far since Joseph backed up against the wall and looked down. I'm sorry, Joseph. I'm being nosy and I hate nosy people. I'll finish the dishes. You and Jack run upstairs and get ready. There are two press shirts for you on the banister. And Jack, this year you can't wear your work boots to church. No argument, nope, don't even try. I didn't wear my work boots. The night was cold and dark when we got to new first congregational and the stars were as thick as cream. Inside, the air was pretty thick too, filled with that sweet waxy smell of candles burning. We were a little late and the pews were mostly filled. So we sat up close to the front where we could pretty much look right into the manger Past the red and blue plaster figures, a pink baby lay mostly naked in the hay, as if anyone would leave a mostly naked new baby in the hay. We sang, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and O Little Town of Bethlehem, and O Come All Ye Faithful, the ones you'd expect, I guess. But Joseph didn't sing, maybe because he never sang, or maybe because he didn't know the songs. And then Reverend Ballou got up to tell the story about Joseph and Mary, two kids, really, not married, who found out that they were going to have a baby. They were in trouble and they knew it. And there was no one to help them and plenty of people who didn't want to help them. But angels came and told them not to be afraid because God would be with them and the baby would be special. And Joseph wasn't afraid anymore. He took care of Mary. And when they had to go to a faraway city and couldn't find a nice place to stay, because like I said, there sure wasn't anyone helping them, Joseph found a place and that's where they had their baby. And the star that shone over them that night led others to them, and they knew the baby was special too. And Joseph and Mary loved the child. And when they went back home, they remembered everything that happened, and they treasured it in their hearts. In the pew, Joseph didn't move the whole time, not a muscle. When the service was over and we had finished Joy to the World, Joseph handed me the hymnal, and I put it on the rack and followed my mother and father out into the aisle. But Joseph didn't leave the pew with us. He was staring at the manger, past the red plaster Joseph and the blue plaster Mary, at the mostly naked child in the hay. We waited for him while the church emptied out. We were just about the last ones to leave. Reverend Ballou took Joseph's hand to shake it, and Joseph said, how much of that story is true? Reverend Ballou considered this. I think it all has to be true, or none of it, he said. The angels, said Joseph, really? Why not, said Reverend Ballou. Because bad things happen, said Joseph. If there were angels, then bad things wouldn't happen. Maybe angels aren't always meant to stop bad things, 
So what good are they to be with us when bad things happen? Joseph looked at him. Then where the hell were they? He said. I thought Reverend Ballou was going to start bawling. And that was the end of our Christmas Eve service at New First Congregational. On Christmas morning, it was snowing hard again. We milked first since cows don't celebrate Christmas and then came into a breakfast of eggs and grapefruit and cherry babka and hot tea. And afterward, the presents, the usual stuff, wool socks for Joseph and me and wool shirts, new jeans, new boots, a new Barlow knife for me and a new buck knife for Joseph. Books, pretty good, except Joseph got a copy of Walden, which looked about as boring as wool socks. When it was over and we sat back, Joseph reading the first page of Walden, probably to be polite, my father said, Joseph, I think there's one more thing. Joseph looked at him. My father pointed to the tree. There was an envelope underneath Joseph's angel. Joseph stood up and looked at it. He opened it slowly. He unfolded the paper. He read it and then read it again out loud. We'll help, he read. Help with what? I said. We'll call Mrs. Stroud tomorrow and see if we can set up a meeting, my mother said. Then I knew. But I think Joseph knew what they meant right away. He put the paper back into the envelope. He slipped the envelope between the pages of Walden. And no kidding, watching him, I thought he was going to start bawling, just like Reverend Ballou. He walked over to my mother, and she put her arms around him. And he put his arms around her and leaned into her, the way he did with Rosie. And then my father came up behind him. He put his hand on Joseph's back. Christmas is the season for miracles, you know. Sometimes they come big and loud, I guess, but I've never seen one of those. I think probably most miracles are a lot smaller and sort of still and so quiet you could miss them. I didn't miss this one. When my father put his hand on Joseph's back, Joseph didn't even flinch.